Hey guys, David here, that guy's like me that. So, as a lot of you guys know, I am new to this whole um, YouTube thing, and um, I'm trying to find my way as far as, um, you know, content and see what you know, people want to hear and see and when it comes to diecast cars. But I'm going to try something a little bit different tonight. And I want to see, and I'd love to hear back. I'd love to get feedback is what I'm trying to say. So, guys, any feedback that you guys would like to give me, please do so. Drop a comment down below. And um, So, we're going to do something where I'm going to try and um, incorporate into some of my videos. And it's... Story time. Yep, story time. So, and there's a reason I am, yeah, there's a reason why I um, think story time is appropriate. Because with, with when we talk about die-cast cars, um, and we, we all have a love for these models and we all have a love of, of cars in general and I guess what I'm trying to say is with every good car comes a good story and my being you know uh, 57 years old and I don't mean to make y'all feel young but if you feel young good for you um but really guys um the story tonight is about the Buick Turbo Bricks. Um, and there is some rants in this video. There is some education in this video. And there are some fantastic bits of information in this video. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history on... on um, the Turbo Regals. So, you know, in 1986 and 1987, um, Buick came out with the Grand National. And let me zoom in a little bit. Hold on. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and it was a um, absolute brute when it came to um, accelerating. Um, and it, it defined, uh, it defined a lot of, um, logic at that point in time. And you say, well, okay, because this little Buick Regal right here in real life was nipping at the heels of the Corvette as far as, um, acceleration went. And there's so some backstory. So, and you say, well, because GM, if you don't know this or not, but General Motors, whether it be Pontiac or Buick or uh, GMC or any other uh, brands, Oldsmobile at the time, um, they bowed and kowtowed to what Chevrolet, the bow tie, wanted. And... You didn't dare, as, G, as a GM division, strike at the Corvette and for way less money than it cost to buy a Corvette and survive that. So the magic of these cars was very short-lived, or was it? Well, we're going to go back a little bit. So I'm just going to leave these right there for now because the story time is going to start. And... Um, so how these cars came into being at all, um, is, so in 1975, okay, so maybe some of y'all were born in 75, and, and that's okay, uh, this is a, a, just a good story, um, but in 1975, Buick, um, was afforded the opportunity to, uh, 
do the pace car for the Indianapolis 500. And the Indianapolis 500 back in those days was a um, premier race. And if you were the pace car for that, um, for that particular race, that was a very um, um, big honor to have your car do that. Well, funny thing was, at the time, Buick did not have a car that could actually perform the way the car needed to perform to pace the um, start of the Indy 500. <laughs> and so they had to cheat. And this is going to get to this in a minute. So in 1975, um, they built a uh, car called the uh, Spirit of America, um, which was the, basically the pace car. It was on the, the 1975 Buick Century. Um, and I'll try and find some uh, stock footage of that car. But they had to, and so in 1975, they had to install a um, 455 cubic inch engine into that century to make that car actually be able to pace the Indy 500. You could not buy, as a general consumer, a 455 cubic inch Buick Century. So it was BS. But the car did the car did the job, and it, it you know it it got through that um, through that thing uh, through the through the Indy 500. Well, so going on a little bit. So in 1976, um, the um, Century Pace car was redone because they wanted, they were doing the 1976 Indy 500 pace car. Well, so in that car, they install, installed a, uh, a through the carburetor forced um, um, turbocharged V6. And that car did the job, but guess what? It was never sold. To the public. The public couldn't buy one. The public could buy a pace car uh, replica and that car would have had a 350 cubic inch Buick engine in it but it wasn't near the performance that the, the turbocharged V6 had. Well so in 1977 and you say okay well how does that get us to this 1986 Barnstormer, when Chevrolet didn't want anything that would compete with the Corvette. Okay, well, good, good question, good question, and I'm going to give you the answer. So in 1977, on the on the, their um, um, what do you call it? Their LeSabers and their um, I don't remember the other one, but on the Sabre body, which was the bigger, the bigger car, um, GM Chevrolet um, gave Buick, because of the success of the pace car, um, the go-ahead to tinker around with that little 3.8 liter Buick V6 with the turbocharger. So GM Chevrolet, Chevrolet, get it. yep, go ahead, do it. So, you know, they weren't quick. They were, they were just cars. I mean, as a matter of fact, um, they were um, the first production cars built by a U.S. manufacturer with a turbocharger on it. Now, let me halt. Back up. So um, the first production American car that had a turbocharger on it was the Corvair. Yes, the Corvair. And it wasn't a huge performer because technology back in those days just couldn't take advantage of, you know, what that turbocharger offered. And 
So, but GM Chevrolet, being at the top of the pile of GM, gave the permission for that car to come into production, and it went into production, and it was not a success. I mean, they sold some, don't get me wrong, but in 1984, and this is where the story starts to kick off. So in 1984, um, technology had grown, and with technology growing came the advent of Sequential port fuel injection. You ever heard that term? Oh, I bet you have. Well, so in 1985, Buick released the Grand National. Notice this one is in black with the silver on the side. And everyone says, no. All Grand Nationals are black. Wrong. No. Right. You are absolutely right. Except for the fact that all Regals were not Grand Nationals. There were... Buick offered the Regal prior to 1986 and 87, and even during 86 and 87, during the heyday, they offered that vehicle in what they called the Regal T-Type. What does T-Type mean? It's turbo, turbo. So you could buy a Buick Regal in T-Type form. So, now, here's where the story's going to go off on some tangents here, guys. This is why I call it story time. Because um, in 1985, 86, 87, that was the only years the um, port fuel injection, I'm sorry, 84 was the start of the port fuel injection, but they didn't really get it right until 85. Um, and that's when it went into production, and that's when this car started to make sense. Now, total side tangent, total side tangent. I have to tell you a story. Story upon a story. Yeah, these stories are going to continue. This is a rabbit hole we are going down together, guys. Um, but I, I hope you guys find this interesting, because I know I do. So back in 1988... Um, I was at a trade school, automotive trade school, and they brought out in 1988, a 1987 Buick Regal Grand National. And I saw something in 1988 that I would have never thought I would have seen. And you know what? I've never seen it since. So, in 1988, Buick had created a system to which the car itself required no starter. And when I say no starter, I mean no starter. There was no turn turn the key. Digga, 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 digga. <clears throat> no, none of that. You pushed a button, and the car went from to running. And when I say going from this to running, it was like this to running. And you say, well, okay, well, what's so special about that? Well, have any of you guys to this date driven a car that has that horrible, in my opinion, a feature that's called the start stop option. So every time you come up to a stop sign and you stop, the car shuts itself off. And then when you touch the gas pedal, it starts back up. Dig -a -dig -a. Mm -hmm. And you take off. Well, so what's different? David, what, what are you trying to tell these guys? Well, it's huge. And we're all getting screwed. And we don't know we're getting screwed. But... The car that I saw in 1988 that was built by 
by GM had no starter. The cars that when you do this at the stop sign and it shuts off and then you <coughs> take off, they still use a starter. Well, do you know why they use a starter? And I'm going to give you one word. Delco. So you say, well, what, what in God's name does Delco mean in this conversation? Well, guys, this is the world we live in. So Delco is not the name of a company. Delco is the name of a family. And the family, um, obviously knee deep in with GM, because you always hear of AC. What? Delco parts. Well, the Delco family holds the patent for the automotive starter. I say automotive starter, I don't mean that it holds the patent for every GM automotive starter. No, I mean the patent for the electric starting motor for every automobile built, whether it's built in Europe, Asia, or the United States, South America. It doesn't matter where they're built. Every starter motor that is put into a car to this day, to this day, pays a royalty or a patent for patent use um, to the Delco family for the use of the starter. And you say, well, how does a car start with no starter? Well, you know, that's a really good question. Now that leads us back to 1984, when the manufacturers started being able to deal with port fuel injection. Okay, well, what does that mean, Dave? Well, I'm going to tell you. So, on a port fuel injected car, every cylinder has um, a fuel injector and a spark plug. And port fuel injection requires computer management to run, uh, you know, the ones and the zeros, ones and zeros, um, that binary code, um, so that the computer on a port fuel injected car knows the exact position of each piston, its location, the firing order, and everything on that engine. Okay, okay, so what, what, where are you going with this? Well, I'm getting there. So, a starterless motor that I saw in 1988 was because you could push a start button on the car. Just like you, you know, on the, the car, so you go, digga, 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 and it starts up. <clears throat> Perfect. Well, how does that run without a starter motor? Well, it's simple. And I want you to think about this. So if the computer knows that the piston that is closest to the top dead center is number six, and it knows, you know, so I'm gonna use a small block Chevrolet, one, eight, four, three, five, six, seven, two, is the um, fire motor. Forget that from the viewer, but yeah. So it knows if the number one piston is the one that's closest to the top, it will then, the computer will then squirt a, uh, out a little bit of fuel into that <laughs> cylinder. And then the computer will then fire that cylinder, which will then force that piston to go down. And it knows that number eight is going to be the next one at the top. And so we will fire a <laughs> of, of fuel at number eight. And it will then fire that one. So it'll start to fire one, eight, four, three, six, five, seven, two. Well, so the motor is already turning without a motor to turn the motor. So it was the coolest thing to see one of these cars. And when you push the button, it just went from sitting there to running. And there was no drama, no digga 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 digga. Mm. 
Nope, none of that. It just went from tick. And you were like, how is that even a thing? And I saw that back in 1988, and we are in 2022, coming up on 2023, and we still have starters on our cars. And the cars today, based on 1988 technology, have come so far. So, every time you have to buy a starter for your car, just, you know, say, hey, thank you, Delco family. We really appreciate your greed. Thank you so much. And um, how this has not been, yeah. So, back to the real story here of the Buick story. So, how did Buick get to build these cars, which were um, as close to buying a Corvette for about half the money. Well, so in 1986, because in 1985, they didn't have the option, not the option, they had not incorporated the intercooler onto the turbocharger. So prior to um, 1984, the cars were carbureted and the turbos blew the wind through the carburetor, which is not the optimum way to run a turbocharger. You want to run it um, where you push the air through the intake and into the cylinders that are pressurized and the fuel is coming into an injector. Well, once they came out with pork fuel injection in um, 1984, they started to get smart and the light bulb went off. And th that's when the gr Grand Nationals that are barnstormers, and that's when they came alive. Um, the Grand National was the first American, well, first car to have more horsepower per cubic inch than they had in cubic inches. Duh, that was kind of self-explanatory, wasn't it? But, so the original Grand National, not, not the GNX, we'll get there, but yeah, we'll get there. But the regular Grand Nationals had 235 horsepower. Now, that doesn't sound a lot by today's standards, and yeah, I get that. But this was the burgeoning of today's technology. This is why these cars are so spectacular. Um, 235 horsepower out of a 231 cubic inch V6. <laughs> mind-blowing. Just mind-blowing. Um, well, so... Chevrolet, let's go back, rewind. Chevrolet being at the top of the heap, didn't want anything, anything to get in the way of the Corvette's status as the elite car. Well, that's where the Turbo 6 emblem came from. So GM, Chevrolet um, told because they could dictate because they're in they're obviously in charge. Told Buick, yeah, no, can't you cannot work with that uh, turbocharged V6 anymore. Done, you're out. Well, that's not fair. Yeah, well, the world's not fair, my pal. Uh, but that's kind of how we got there. But as Buick's farewell to their 3.8 liter, 231 cubic inch V6 engine that produced 235 horsepower, they created as a farewell party, the Grand National X. And all this is coming back to diecast. Trust me, we are not, we're going on a loop here, just a little loop, but we're coming back. So the GNX, was um, produced only in 1997. 
And do you want to guess who worked with Buick on creating the GNX? Mitch, you can't guess. Unless you're a Buick guy and know it, but um, McLaren. Yes, McLaren. The British company, McLaren. Um, they had a um, facility in Southern California called ASC. And that's, that's for, um, stands for American uh, Sunroof Corporation. And they engineered a larger turbocharger, a different computer strategy, and some body, some body modifications and whatnot. But when they created the GNX, um, this car, rather than building 235 horsepower out of a 231 cubic inch V6, created 276 horsepower out of a 231 cubic inch V6. Unheard of. Absolutely unheard of. So, but that was the swan song. Chevrolet shut down Buick's ability to play with the turbocharged V6. And look at where Buick is today. Well, they're building enclaves and, you know, your grandmother's car. They were a beast back in 1986 and 87 because of how technology let them build these cars. And then Chevrolet shut it down. And I don't have an example here in front of me, but there was one ex exception. Um, so in 1989, and we'll get back to the Bukes here in a minute, um, but in 1989, Chevrolet gave the okay to Pontiac. Yeah, the Trans Am. To, because the Trans Am was going to be used as the pace car in the 1999, I'm sorry, 1989 um, uh, Indy 500. And going back to Buick's success with their 231 V6, that was a great engine for the you know, for its acceleration and whatnot, Pontiac was given a one time, one time, for one production year to build 1989 um, 20th anniversary Trans Ams, because the original Trans Am came out in 1969, and so 1989 was 89, 20, yeah, 20 years. Um, so they were building an anniversary one, and they were building a pace car for the Indy 500. So they got to build um, a, a, a 1989 Trans Am for the anniversary cars and the um, Indy 500 cars one for one for one round, and they only built 1,555 of them. And guys, they're spectacular cars. I have a copy of that car um, in diecast. But I don't have it here. I'm getting. I'm going to um, meet my moving company tomorrow, and all my cars will be here. But I wanted to do this video because now we're getting back to the Buicks, and here's where I get. So this one, we'll get to Hotwheels in that. Hang on. So this one is the the new release from Racing Champions Mint, and. So when I saw this on the pegs the other day, I had to have it. Um, and you say, well, but it's not a Grand National. No, it's not. It's the T-Type. So it's not as good? Well, 1985, if you go back, remember, was not, did not have the uh, intercooler and whatnot. So the 85s were not. But this car is very important visually, especially for this video. So let's go ahead and bust her loose. So, this car is highly accurate. The wheels are spot on the money. Um, and you say, well, how do you know they're spot on the money? Well, I'll tell you. Um, hold on, I'll get to that in a minute. 
but Racing Champions builds a great, great, great um, looking G body. And in a G body beating the Monte Carlo, the Bulls Cutlass, and the Buick Regal. Um, but the reason why I wanted this one is because it represents the pre all black Grand Nationals. And a lot of this is part of the story. So, and we're getting to the rest. There's, like I said, there's a lot of rants in here, guys. So please um, forgive me and, 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 you know, give me a couple, give me a little bit. Give me this video to wrap all of this up and to bring all this to a rational conclusion. Um, but, so, the um, Regals, were available in the regular custom trim. Then they had the um, um, the limited trim, and then they had the Grand National trim in 1986 and 87. Because in 1986, that's when they put the intercoolers in these cars, and that's when these became monsters. And I mean monsters, and that's what pissed off Chevrolet. And that was what started the, the end of the magnificent black boxes, as we called them back in the day. But you could buy a T-type Regal in either the custom trim or the limited trim. You could get this car with a turbo V6, with the intercooler, with leather trim, a front bench seat, well, split bench, but it didn't have the console. I mean, you know, you had the shifter on the column where you had to pull it down. And, I, you know, with leather interior, and it was your grandpa's Oldsmobile. Or, I'm sorry, Buick. But, um, so every one of these cars, and you can look them up on the internet. Um, look up Buick Turbo T-Type, 1986 or 87, and you will see these cars in every production color known to man. Coming full circle, you'll we'll bring them back to this. So, Hot Wheels. So, my next rant is on Hot Wheels. So, I'm going to move this one out of the way just for a minute. And we'll come back to it. How many times do we have to see the same car being used here? And here. Guys. You won't be able to see this. Mm -mm, I doubt you won't. Um, the license plate number on this car and this car are identical. The only difference on these two cars, and I mean the only difference on these two cars, is... I'll zoom in a little bit, see if we can catch this. Um, the wheels on this one are different than the wheels on this one. Well, I mean, why? You know, I got to pay seven bucks at Walmart for that one. So I can pay seven bucks for Walmart for that one. And all I get is a different wheel. Well, hell, I could have done a wheel swap on these cars. Seriously, could have done a wheel swap and saved the seven dollars. But enough of that brand. So... Um, we're going to go on with the story. And this is where my personal story comes into this. We're going to go ahead and open this one because it is what it is. You know what we're going to do? We're going to open this one too just because we can. Ooh, sorry. I didn't need to hit the camera. Um... This way, I could probably show you the wheel differences a little bit better. Um, but, so, as you can see, this one has that wheel style. And I'm going to get this in here and see if you can see the license plate. Just so you can see, I'm, you know, I'm not telling you bull BS, but the license plate on this car. Is the same as the license plate on this car. The only difference on these two cars is 
the wheel style. Oh, okay. Fine. Fine. So, where my... So, there's another... These rants are... This is why this was a fun video for me to think about how I was going to do this. And, and I'm doing this on the fly, guys. So, please... Um, please forgive me if I sound like I'm going all over the map because I'm trying not to. But, um, so then Hot Wheels, to add insult to injury, offers us this one from, yeah. So, no... Grand Nationals or Grand National X. And you know this one is a GNX because, and I'll show you how you know. You see the little vents here on the on the uh, fender? Only GNXs had vents on the fender. You can see on this car, there are absolutely no vents on the fender. So you say, well, how is this adding insult to injury? Guys, there was never Never, from 1986 to 1987, a Grand National X, or a Grand National for that matter, that was ever produced in any color other than black. What is this car doing here? What? Why? Why? It doesn't exist. Um, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother, yeah. And then, and then Hot Wheels has the audacity to do this car in a pearl white. Not just white, but you can see the pearl. <laughs> now, do I have it? Yeah. Do I have it because I'm in love with this car? Nope. Nope. I got it because I'm, um, and as soon as my collection gets here, I'm going to bust out every G body I have from every manufacturer that I have because I have a fabulous. G body collection. That's why I had to have this one, this one, this one, and now that one. Um, so, well, Dave, why do you have to have all of these? Well, good question. And here's where we go back to the next part of the story. So, I owned a 1987 Buick Regal. Nope, I owned two 1987 Buick Regal. Nope, nope, I owned three Buick Regal Grand Nationals. And the first one, how I got three was, the first one got stolen and I replaced it with the insurance money. And when I replaced it with the insurance money, um, I had sold another car and we went to lunch from work one day and I threw, um, I, for inadvertently, I had um, $6,000 in cash on me um, from another car that I had sold um, just before we had gone to lunch and I had put it in the trunk of the car in a box. And when I came out from lunch, that car was stolen too, along with <laughs> the six grand that was in the trunk of this car. So I go off and I get number three. I replaced it. And I get number three and I had about three months and it got, I, I had long enough, long enough to have a, a friend of mine who installed stereos and whatnot. We put the big boom box in the trunk. And I mean, look guys, I was, you know, young, but we put the boom box in the trunk and the, the audio deck up in the, in the front, the, you know, the head unit and everything in the, the bow speakers and the doors and whatnot, and stolen. Well, so when my insurance company, that shall remain nameless, um, because I like the insurance company, but they said to me, they said, uh, David, um, we really appreciate you being a client um, for as many years as you've been a client, but we're not going to insure another one of these. <laughs> so I said, okay, so I cannot have another Grand National. They're like, yes, you can. 
not have another one of these. Well, you can have one, but we just won't. We're not going to insure it. You can insure it with somebody else. And I said, okay, fine. So I was at a car show one day and I ran into a guy that had one of these cars. Now, remember, we said these weren't made in white, and, but it was actually one of these cars that was a 1987 model and it was all metallic burgundy with a burgundy velour interior. And, but it was a Grand National, but it's not called the Grand National. So it had a different VIN body code than, mm -hmm. you follow where we're going with this? So I bought this burgundy Buick Regal uh, T-Type, which was just as fast and fun as that one. And my insurance company said, oh yeah, not a problem. We'll insure that one. And I said, okay, great. And then they did. And I bought it and I drove it for uh, three years and no one ever stole it. I, 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 why? Make the car in black, they steal it. Make the car in burgundy. I think the guys in the, in the, I don't think a lot of guys knew these were even built, um, but You'd see the, the turbo bulge on the hood, but you could buy this hood from a junkyard or a Buick or whatever and put it on your car. But real time, guys, these cars are built in regular colors and with regular trim that are called T-types, and they are not Grand Nationals. Um, so all of this having been said, um, I hope you guys um, have at least partly enjoyed this little bit of story time and sharing diecast with um, with you guys and seeing some some different stuff that you know I'm sure all you guys have these fast and furious cars and and that's great but the stories alone on these cars and how this car got to be where it the the icon that it is in in the automotive world and i guess that's why i have them and that's why i have a ginormous collection of uh the 442s and the the grand nationals and the t-types um and the monte carlo ss's and whatnot and you'll see all that coming up so i will do a dedicated g-body video but um i i, I just hope um excuse me um i hope that story time is not a bad thing. I'd like to think that I bring to the table something a little bit different than what all the other diecast guys bring to the table. And I hope you guys like what you're hearing and what you're seeing. And guys, I'd love to have comments on critiques, um, what I'm doing right, what you think I'm doing wrong. Um, I wanna learn. Like I said, I'm, trying to do the best I can to create this channel and any help that you guys can give via comments and advice, I will gladly hear. But with all that having been said, guys, like and subscribe if you like what you're hearing. And like I said, I, I'm going to be different than anybody else. So if you don't like the style of videos that I do, well, that's okay. I mean, yeah. But um, with that, guys, I'm going to let this video be done for the night. It went for a little bit longer than I wanted to, um, but I hope you guys took a little bit of information from this, and I hope it, you know, it helps you appreciate how these cars ended up being how they became. So, with that, guys, have a great night, and we will talk to you very soon.